Well, I'm starting to drive a little bit in Hong Kong. Not too much, but some. So if you see me driving, please do not wave because I need two hands on the steering wheel. <clears throat> the other day I drove to the seminary. And anytime I drive, I put the address where I'm going in the GPS. And there's a voice that says, go straight, turn right, get off at the next exit. I made it to the seminary so easy, it was so easy. I put the address in for the church on Thursday coming back, and I toured Hong Kong. <laughs> I must have taken 20 rights, 20 lefts, and I knew when I wound up at Monkey Mountain, <laughs> maybe something wasn't right. But I kept listening to that GPS voice, and I finally, miraculously, made it back to church. Now, we all need direction, don't we? When we look at Amos, we don't often hear sermons from the prophet Amos. But if we read Amos, we will find that he is giving direction to God's people. Written sometime along 750 B.C., when Jeroboam II was king of Israel. It was a time when people had moved away from God. They had worshipped false idols. They had begun to seek other things in their life other than Jesus Christ, other than God. And it is Amos who comes with prophetic thunder. Thunder and lightning as the prophets would often speak. And he stands in the gates and he tells the people to seek God. Actually, if we read Amos, we find he's full of images. He will tell us that God's word is like a lion that prowls. He will tell us, on the other hand, that our sin weighs God down like a cart overburdened with sheaves. He will tell us, on the other hand, that God's judgment will be like a fire that will come swiftly through the house that will burn the wall at Gaza. He will tell us in another place that there is justice in the gates. And then he will give us an image toward the end, as the prophets always do, an image of renewal. That God will take the brokenness and the damage and the ruins and he will build them up new and fresh again like building a new house. I tried to think this week what it's like to think of Amos preaching in his day. There must have been a deep and dark contrast between the darkness and between the light. That Amos in preaching was trying to shine God's light into the darkness, but maybe people seeing and hearing the light didn't quite understand it. I've been reading while I'm here in Hong Kong two books. It's the kind of thing I will sometimes do side by side. One book is Ernest Hemingway, A Movable Feast. Ernest Hemingway, by the way, in 1941 came to Hong Kong. He stayed in Repulse Bay. He was working on another book and toured around Hong Kong. I don't know that he ever wrote anything about Hong Kong, but he was here, as best I can understand, for a couple of months. In reading A Movable Feast, it's about his time as a young man in Paris. He was trying to make his career as a writer. He had been a journalist, a war reporter. But now he was writing books, and while he's in Paris, he writes about his experiences, that Paris is like a movable feast. There's so much to do, so much to take in. But he writes about his friendship with Scott Fitzgerald of the great Gatsby, and he writes about his quest for fame, and he writes about his experiences, and then we flip forward to Hemingway's life, and we know that he took his own life. I'm reading that and thinking about Hemingway's life, and there's laughter and yet much sadness. And then on the other hand, I'm reading a book, Hudson Taylor's autobi Autobiography. Hudson Taylor, a missionary to China who started the China Inland Mission. He lived from 1832 to 1905. And Hudson Taylor writes in his autobiography about, as a boy, how he always wanted to go to China. And as a boy, he felt called to go to China. He later became a doctor, and he left England and became a China missionary. 
But in reading about his experiences in the 1800s, mostly in early 1900s, you read about his fighting the elements, the mosquitoes and the humidity, fighting the elements, the rivers and the boats, and people would steal stuff from him and trying to learn the language, and then facing persecution because he was preaching the gospel in many places where people did not want to hear the gospel and then later in his life fighting his own health that caused him to have to return to England before he came back to China. His story is remarkable because he talks about faith and sometimes his lack of faith but he talks about the miracle of how God provided all along the way how some days he had no food and food would come some days he needed money and money would come some days he just needed rest and rest would come. In fact, in reading about his faith in Jesus Christ, in reading it, sometimes I felt guilty about my own sometimes lack of faith. And I think about Amos preaching in a similar time the contrast between the darkness on the one hand and the despair where maybe in a world there is some laughter but maybe deep sadness in the heart in a world where there's a man trying to shine the light in the darkness and he sacrificed all of his being all of his resources, all of his energy he's given to God to preach the gospel and to tell people to seek God and live. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Amos this morning and I want to talk to you about seeking the Lord. We find that Amos, as was sung by the choir, that passage from, I believe, Jeremiah, we see that Amos gives a similar message. Three times he will use the word seek. And so today, as we talk about seeking the Lord, we see in chapter 5, beginning at verse 4, he says, this is what the Lord says to the house of Israel, seek me and live. Verse 5, do not seek Bethel, do not go to Gilgal, do not journey to Beersheba, for Gilgal will surely go into exile and Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Verse 6, seek the Lord and live. He repeats himself a second time. Or he will sweep to the house of Joseph like a fire and it will devour and Bethel will have no one to quench it, no one to quench the fire. Verse 7, or verse 14, the third time. Seek good and not evil that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as you say he is. Verse 15, hate evil and love good. Maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Now if we hear the message of Amos, his message really boils down to one word or two, two words, seek or seek God. It sounds like a very simple message. If you notice in verse 4, he begins with a message, but he says, seek me and live. He's writing prophetically, but he's also writing as a poet. He's writing and communicating in such a way as if God is speaking. And God is saying to His own people in Israel who have turned away from Him, Seek me and live. And what we have here is Amos saying, Put first things first. Seek the Lord and live. Now church, I want to say to you, that one of the challenges of our life of faith in Jesus Christ, one of the joys of our life in faith in Jesus Christ, is to put Jesus Christ first. To seek Him above all things. To seek Him in our marriage. To seek Him in how we raise our children. To seek God in our finances. To seek God in our career, our jobs. To seek God in the daily challenges and troubles and even anxieties that sometimes we face. To seek God. But we notice here that this word seek in verse 4, put first things first, comes as a kind of warning. Because if we look at the verse, we see that he says, seek me or seek God and live, but do not seek. He says, do not seek three different places. Do not seek Bethel. Do not seek Gilgal. Do not seek Beersheba. It's very interesting because if we understand the passage, what we understand is all those places, Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba were all at one time spiritual places. You can go through and see the work of Moses in one of those places, the work of Joshua in another. 
You can see the worship of God in another. And yet now, removed from those days, we see that what has happened is the people have moved away from God. If we lived in Amos' day, we would have known that Bethel and Gilgal and Beersheba were places of idol worship. In fact, Gilgal was the center of idolatry. It was a place where there was false worship, the worship of false gods. I think if we go back to Amos' day, we realize there was idol worship. If we move forward to the first century in the Apostle Paul's day, say in the book of Romans where he writes his letter, or maybe to the church at Thessalonica, in the ancient days in Rome, people would put what was known as Lairs or lars would be household gods. They would actually put those household gods, they would place them in their windows. They, as in Amos' day, as in the days of the Romans and the Greeks, would talk to those gods. They would pray to those gods. They would ask those gods to give them good luck or good fortune or to change the circumstances in their lives. They would pray to those gods. Now church, I would say in the days in which day and age in which we live, it's not unusual for people to have idols. We could go to Africa where idol worship is practiced in commonplace in some parts of Africa. We might even come to Asia. We might even go to the United States of America where people have idols that they pray to and worship and talk to and believe in some kind of good luck or good fortune in their lives. And yet what we see here is that Amos says there should never be false worship. There should never be a turning to idols to worship them. Idols, he will say, are dead, they're not alive, but seek God. He will say in the next verse, seek God and live. And then he will talk about the fires that could sweep through the house of Joseph. It's interesting because he talks about, on the one hand, false worship. He speaks, on the other hand, of the fires of God's judgment. Maybe today in the modern church, we don't speak of God's judgment enough. But here, what he speaks of are the horrors of God's judgment that come when we refuse God, when we turn against God, when we do not follow God. I think sometimes it's not the kind of message that preachers like to preach. It's not the kind of message that we like to hear. But Amos, when he preaches, preaches with a burdened heart. He preaches with a spirit of love. He preaches because the sins of Amos' people and the people of God have weighed God down. And he wants that burden to be lifted by their turning to God so that the fires of judgment can be lifted, and so he uses the word seek, the same thing Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I think a sermon like this should cause us to stop and ask the question, or maybe the questions, whom do you seek? What are you seeking in your life? If I go back to Hemingway's quest may be for fame, If I go back to Hudson Taylor, his quest, one quest, to serve Jesus Christ at all costs. But I realize in the world in which we live, people seek many things. I was thinking this week of things through the years that people have talked to me about. Maybe things I observed. I think in our world sometimes we may seek fame. In our world we may seek fortune. In our world, we may seek some material thing that we want. And I don't know that that those things are necessarily bad, but when they obsess us and consume us and we never put God first, that's when they are bad. But in all the years I've been a pastor, some 35 now plus years I've been a pastor, how many people through the years have said to me, Pastor, I just wish I could be happy. I just wish I could find happiness. As if maybe they were seeking happiness. I have a book in my library back in the States. And the title of the book is Happiness is a Choice. And maybe the idea would be to hand someone a book and say, Happiness is a choice. Just go out and be happy. I'm not sure it works that way. Aristotle and other philosophers would talk about happiness and what it meant truly to be happy. But I think if we acknowledge Amos' message, seek the Lord and live. 
the fires of judgment remind us of a warning of ju- God's judgment that will one day come. But the priority of Christ in our lives, put Jesus Christ first, seek the Lord and live. Put first things first. This is where we discover the hope of Christ, the joy of Christ, the peace of Christ that runs deeper in our hearts like a deep river that brings us, yes, happiness, but more than happiness, the glory and peace and wisdom of Christ. This is what Amos is saying. But the second time he uses the word here and he speaks of this sense of God's work, what he speaks of not only is seek the Lord, but now the second time he says, seek the Lord and live. It's interesting because he speaks of people who are going through a kind of apathetic existence. Maybe they're going to worship in Bethel, going to worship in Gilgal, going to worship in Beersheba, but they're apathetic. Maybe they're going to worship, but they don't know God, and yet he says, turn back to God so that you can really live. I like what J.I. Packer says. He says that God has made us to know Him. And J.I. Packer says that the people who follow Jesus Christ, who seek Him first, they have a great energy for God. And what Amos is warning of, seek the Lord and live, is what Oswald Chambers said years ago, keep your life constantly in touch with God. That his surprising power can break through at any time. What Amos was saying, seek the Lord and live, acknowledge the power of God. Beware, he says, of the judgment, but then the fires of judgment, this image that he gives. But then he turns down there in verse 8. He made the Pleiades and the Orion He turns the shadow of death into morning. He makes the day dark as night. He calls the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is His name. If the fires warn us of judgment, the stars alert us to God's creative work. You can take the trolley or maybe take a taxi as we did one day and you can go up to the peak If you can catch it on the right day as the sun sets, you might see walking around the peak a beautiful sunset. The sun sparkling and glistening off the South China Sea on the waters. If you stay late enough and you find a clear night in Hong Kong, which from what I'm experiencing is sometimes not always easy, but if you found a clear night, you could look up at the stars And you could see the constellations and you could see the skies. And you could look at the waters, maybe the the moon or the stars glistening off the waters as the boats cruise through the beautiful harbor. You could even look across the harbor to the buildings lit up. And you could look out to the flats that are towering, jutting from the earth with all their lights. And I think this is the kind of appeal that Amos is making. He could say, look at the stars, look at the South China Sea, look at the light bulbs reflecting through the flats as you stand on the peak, look at the boats moving about, look at the people pushing through the MTR, look at the world in which you live, its technology, its sophistication, its simplicity, its humidity. Look at all those things and remember that God is creator of the ends of the earth. And Amos is pleading with them. On the one hand, he says there's false worship. It's not right. On the other hand, he says, he gives us a very powerful image. You've literally turned justice into wormwood. And you have laid righteousness in verse 7 to rest in the earth. The word rest could be translated in Hebrew. You've pushed aside righteousness. You've pushed God aside completely. Another prophet would say you're backsliding you've moved away from God and I think sometimes truthfully this kind of thing can happen I think what we do in the morning men um, we get up in the morning and, and we shave we brush our teeth the other morning I was shaving and I realized it's starting to snow on my head my hair is turning grayer and grayer 
and we shave and while we're shaving we think about the day. We may think of our calendar, we may think of our schedule, we may think of our meeting. It may cause us anxiety. We may think of when we need to leave, checking our watch or a clock on our phone or maybe a clock on the wall to see what time it is. We may get to the MTR, drive, and we find ourselves under pressure at work. We may feel even pressure at home. We may feel pressure from our family. We may feel pressure from the world. But we see ourselves. But men, do we think of God as our creator? Women, you do the same thing. You put on your makeup. You fix your hair. And as you do that, you begin to think about all the things that you have to do. But do you think of God who made you? And as we look at our reflections in the mirror, do we acknowledge God is the creator of the ends of the earth? That everything in our life goes back to Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Amos would say, moving forward, He created you. And He created you with a purpose. And He created you to serve God. And He created you. And God loves you. And Amos is pleading with the people before God to seek the Lord and live, to shine God's light. God made them. The stars are a reminder. And then God made us to serve Him because He ends with a kind of poetic climax, a prophetic climax where He says there, The Lord is His name. In the darkness, you almost hear them using the names of other gods, little g, at Bethel and Gilgal and Beersheba but he says you need to remember the Lord is his name the Lord is his name the Lord is his name and serve him I wonder if we keep our lives in touch with God so much that a surprising power can break through I wonder if our hearts are such that we are pushing God aside or are our hearts such that we are welcoming Christ in all that He wants to do. I wonder if maybe the GPS of God's Word, the direction that God is giving us, if God is speaking clearly, seek me and live, seek the Lord and live. I wonder if we're taking detours and wrong turns and traveling the wrong roads and not listening to God or following His voice of instruction. The stars call us back to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, to walk with Christ and to follow Him again, to seek first His kingdom. The third time the word seek, we see it as we read it earlier in verse 14. Seek good and not evil. Now he begins to move from seek me, the personal relationship with the Almighty God. Then to seek the Lord and live, to renew the life of Christ in you so that you can really live again in the joy and hope of Christ. And now he moves to seek the Lord and do good. That is, what's in our hearts will lead to action. That is, Christ in our hearts will lead to the right communication and language. That is, what's in our heart will put our feet in the right places that's what's in our heart will help our hands to serve Christ by serving others. And so what he speaks of here is a very clear message. See good and not evil that you may live so the Lord of hosts will be with you. As you have spoken, hate evil and love good. As I was thinking about Ernest Hemingway stepping on the shores of Repulse Bay in Hong Kong and thinking of Hudson Taylor trying to survive, sharing the gospel, I thought of the contrast. I began to think of the evil in 1941 and the evil in 1896, Hudson Taylor. I began to think of the evil in our world even in a place like Hong Kong or the United States and the evil that sometimes we witness on the evening news or in the morning papers or maybe even on Facebook. I was thinking about Paris. 
people trying to pull their lives back together. And I was thinking about what happened in Pakistan on Easter Sunday, where in a park, Christian families lost their lives in an explosion. And I was thinking about what happened not long ago in Brussels. And I found myself thinking about how evil, there are pockets of evil in the world. Then I began to think about pornography in our world that brings evil and meanness and hatred and bitterness. And some of the things that go on in the world where meanness seems to win out, the evil of it. Then I came to the human heart where the prophet Jeremiah said, The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Sometimes we don't even know our own hearts. And I began to think that even in my heart, there are dark pockets, evil. And even in your heart. And so that's why we need to seek the Lord and do good. Seek the Lord whose goodness can wash our hearts as white as snow and push away the darkness by His light and take away the hatred and bitterness and evil and replace it with His goodness so that we can do good. Whatever Christ has called us to do, He's called us to do good in His name. We are to hate evil, He says, and to love good. We are to establish justice in the gates. The gates is where people would come and go. The gates are like a door at your house. What you do is you exit and you enter. You exit and you enter all the time. The gates are where we feel the anxiety of our lives. The gates are where we pay the bills. We raise the children, change diapers. The gates are where we struggle sometimes with faith. The gates are where we rejoice in all that God is doing. The gates are where we move and live and have our being. The gates are when we're on the MTR when it's crowded. Or the gates are when we're fighting traffic. Or the gates might be driving down the road listening to the GPS, hoping the GPS gives us the right direction. Turn right. But the gates here speak of God's work intersecting the daily lives of God's people. And so he says, seek the Lord and do good. And as we seek the Lord and do good, it may be that the Lord of hosts, on the one hand, in verse 14, will be with you. And on the other hand, in verse 15, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. I have a stone in my office in Texas. It's flat on the bottom and it's a rock. And on the rock, there's a Hudson Taylor quote. Someone gave this to me years ago. And Hudson Taylor once said, I used to ask God to help me. Then I asked if I might help Him. I ended up asking Him to do His work through me. With God's presence and by His grace, we can seek the Lord and we can do good. I have a friend, his name is Joshua. If you knew Joshua and you heard his testimony, you'd be amazed at what God has done. Amos is pushing forward to chapter 9, verse 9, where what he will speak of is the real message he has in giving the fires of God's judgment as a warning, in speaking of the stars, return to acknowledge God as the creator of your very life, in using the gates as a symbol of the movage, moving and passage of people's lives, that they are to seek the Lord and do good. In chapter 9, verse 9, Amos will say, On that day, that is when we turn to God, when we actually seek the Lord and live. Seek the Lord and do good. On that day, Amos says, I will raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. I will repair its damages. I will repair its ruins. Now I know you well enough to know that if you have a car and the automobile, the car or the van is broken, you will take it to an auto mechanic and you will have it fixed. 
If the air conditioning unit in your window or in your house or your flat is not working, what you will do is you will call a repair man or repair woman and you will say, I think it's out of Freon. Would you please come and repair it? They will set a time. You will meet them there. They will repair the air conditioner and you will be thankful. If you have a piece of jewelry, a ring that's broken or maybe a necklace that's broken, you will take it to a jeweler. Or a watch like I did the other day down at Central. Had a watch that um, the battery was dead. So I took it and I explained what I wanted done. And so 40 Hong Kong dollars, I gave it to him. And I watched him while he took the watch apart and put a new battery in there. A broken watch needs to be repaired. If you have a broken piece of jewelry or a watch, you take it to a jeweler to have it repaired. If you have a leak in a faucet or a leak on the roof when it rains like it did earlier today you'll have it fixed but I wonder if we think of our spiritual lives when they're broken and damaged and in ruins I wonder if we ask God to repair them as we seek the Lord and live my friend Joshua As a young man, he really had no family. He was adopted by another family that, to hear him tell it in the simplest terms, he more or less rebelled against that family. If Joshua walked through the door, he works out a lot, so he'd have muscles. He'd probably be wearing a short sleeve shirt, which I was just thinking I should be wearing a short sleeve shirt today. But his muscles are so big, his biceps... He would look almost like a United States Marine or a soldier. His biceps would be huge. If Joshua told you his story. He rebelled against the family that took him in. And then he got out on his own and he made lots of money. I mean lots of money. You could almost hear him telling it. He had a white collar job. With his white collar job he made lots of money. Had a family. And he started taking that money not giving it to his family to meet their needs, but buying cocaine. Joshua were here, he would tell you that he snorted cocaine and wasted his life on cocaine for a long time. Until one day, he hit rock bottom. I can almost hear Joshua saying it now, when you hit rock bottom, you need to turn to the rock, Jesus Christ. And his life hit rock bottom And he turned to the rock, Jesus Christ. And he began to seek the Lord. He began to seek the Lord and to live. And he began to seek the Lord and to do good. Christ changed his life. He went to a ministry that helped drug addicts dry out, get off of drugs. And then he started looking for ways to serve Christ. And to make a very long story short, he wound up serving in Oak Ridge Ministries where today he seeks the Lord and does good. He takes in drug addicts just like he was. And he dries them out. And he helps them to seek the Lord, to seek the Lord and live and seek the Lord and do good. And Joshua's testimony is that Jesus Christ changed his life. As he began to put first things first, as he began to seek the Lord and really began to live in the joy of Christ, the peace of Christ, as he began to seek the Lord and do good, now he does a lot of good for God's kingdom by helping drug addicts get off of drugs and helping people who need direction find direction. And helping people who are lost in darkness find the joy of God's light. Amos stands in the gates and he says to you this morning, Seek me, seek the Lord and live. Seek the Lord and do good. So that His graciousness, God's grace, like it did in Joshua's life, like it did in Amos' life, like it can do in your life, can turn the bad 
to good, the darkness to light, the hopelessness to hope, the restlessness to God's peace. I want you to bow your heads and hearts today in the spirit of worship. Lord, we thank you that you can repair the brokenness of our lives. We thank you, God, that you can take the damage. And as we turn to you or turn back to you, Lord, you can restore the damaged parts of our lives. And Lord, you can make them fresh, new. Thank you, Lord, that you can take our life in ruins and you can build it to serve and to do good for you. Lord, today I pray for the person or persons who's moved away from God, that he or she would turn back to you. I pray for the person, Lord, who feels broken or feels like his or her heart is damaged. Or maybe, God, somebody here today feels like their life is in ruins. God, my prayer is that you would just impress upon their hearts that you can heal the broken places. You can restore the ruins. You can make new what once was torn down. Then, Father, help all of us to seek you. Lord, begin with me today. Help me to seek you with all of my heart. And even as was sung earlier, to call upon your name. Help us all to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.